is it true you do core training every morning? Uh, <laughs> not every morning, but in a, in a base training phase, um, it would, could be like five, six days a week. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Ask Lattice. Today I'm joined by Johnny Kidd and Johnny is a new coach here at Lattice but he's also got a wealth of experience and is a high level boulderer. So Johnny has bouldered V14, is that mm -hmm. right? Yep. That's Working good. on a V15 at the minute. Yep. He's also got a MSc in sports science uh, as well as your BSc, so your undergrad. So yep. uh, very well educated from university. So my first question is, what lessons did you learn from your like formal education and, and how have you applied them to your own climbing and training? <laughs> Going straight with it. It's you. a tricky one. He's yeah. like, oh, I, I didn't learn anything. <laughs> so long ago now. <laughs> um, so, I, well, yeah, the formal education, I think it's been quite difficult translating a lot of it into climbing specifically, mainly because when I was at uni, climbing didn't really seem to be a thing. Um, so in, lot, in the literature a lot of bridging like, the gap yeah yeah it's not necessarily climbing specific research, exactly but. yeah i think we had one lecture where they mentioned things about climbing and it was to do with friction yeah or, okay. of like a foot on a bot or like, or like rubber on a, a thing and that's yeah. that wasn't exactly what we train here yeah, yeah um so a lot of the things i think we're adapting sort of what i learned through endurance and strength and, and strength and power work um of how that was developed in athletes and a lot of um a lot of our studies were sort of looking at like interventions so in extra beetroot juice was quite a high um focus topic that they did a lot of research on yep. so that was mainly looking at the endurance side in like uh cyclists and long distance runners and stuff like that and how to improve um i believe it increased the dietary nitrates in the body which made that your body was actually able to use oxygen more so improving the aerobic capacity yeah, yeah exactly um, so a lot of it is about making inferences from uh general research in sports science yes. and then trying to apply that exactly, to, yeah. to particular aspects of, of your climbing. Yeah, exactly. And I, I tried to make my dissertations the uh, very climbing specific, so that, that's where I managed to in include my interests into it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, of course. But when I first went to uni, I wasn't really that climbing focused. Um, I'd sort of only started climbing a little bit just before going, so I was more of a tennis player before going into it and then yeah, 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 yeah. it took over from there. That's really interesting to see. I actually have like a very similar introduction into climbing and, and research so i did a uh, bsc in sports science yep. i started climbing on as 18 which is the same time you started climbing yep. um and i'd done that a little bit before but i went to uni maybe a year or two into climbing and that's where i really thought actually this climbing thing's really interesting and and then i started trying to focus all of my research yep. as much of that independent study as i could on, on climbing itself yeah nice that's cool okay so um my next question is is it true you do core training every morning uh, <laughs> not every morning, but in a in a base training phase, um, it would could be like five six days a week. Okay, so uh, so I mean, basically, Johnny has like brought in this bug of core training, yeah. which everyone seems to have like got on the train with. Where like we always see Johnny in the morning doing core training in the lock up here, and now everyone's like, oh, maybe there's something in that. Like I should core train all the time, and that like, everyone started doing crunches and yeah. I, like I I think it's one of the the easier exercise or easier types of exercise to do that you don't have to warm up a ton to do it yeah. you can do it quite quickly and i don't feel like when you're climbing the stimulus can even like on a board the stimulus won't necessarily be high enough i don't think for keeping like or creating that tension especially like around the abdominal muscles yeah and i think just adding in core exercises is a really quick and easy way that you can do something and a lot of my climbing or like hardest climbs have ended up being in steep overhung like terrain so i think it's obviously helped some way in that respect because yeah. otherwise i wouldn't have had the success on the rock so if you know about johnny's climbing he's pretty much a bit of a cave dweller in a cave called bibbins cave right and yeah and that's where his project is that's why you've probably done most of your, a lot your hard of, I spent a lot british of ascents there. in there yeah. um so yeah i think core training is specifically yeah. quite important for your, yeah, your for sure. so maybe that's quite he's hooked on it yeah <laughs> Your first major sporting commitment was tennis, right? So you mm -hmm. were a tennis player before you started climbing, yep. before you went to uni. Um, I want to know how you have kind of transferred any of the lessons you learned from tennis to climbing. Do you think it helped you get into climbing or improve your ability to get better at it? Uh, I think the 
so essentially my tennis coach was really into doing sort of different kind of exercises in order to um rather than just sort of yeah it was more about training the movement rather than muscle okay so we he got us to have like or him and a couple of my friends were sort of into climbing and he sort of suggested it'd be like a good thing to do um obviously tennis you were holding a racket so there's a grip element that's going on with that as well and i think that has helped especially with sort of the, the extensive muscles in the forearm for me yeah. um, because they're quite well developed. Were um, you getting tennis elbow before you even started climbing? Uh, no, I, <laughs> I think because we did quite a lot of conditioning work. Okay. I'd quite, we'd, we'd balanced that out quite well. Um, and, but I think that side is, is probably what has helped me the most with, with it because um, tennis we were training, well, me and, my, me and my, like, the squad that I was with, we were sort of doing about like 20, 24 hours of training a week. Oh, wow. so, really high volume exactly yeah. yeah and and you can kind of do it with something like tennis because it's such like a skill-based sport and it's slightly less physical and there's you're not yeah. limited by such small muscle group yes um and yeah i think then coming into climbing it was like all of a sudden it was quite easy to hit the volume of training for me and without feeling fatigued um okay and i yeah. think that allowed like i think it held back my technique because i could just pull through moves on the holds that i could hold on to yeah but i do think that has helped me um be able to develop like a, like a sustainable sort of level of training that I've been able to maintain over the years. Yes, I think there's two really interesting things in that. Um, first is the volume of training you're doing. So mm. I think we see this a lot. If, if ever I'm working with a new athlete who's um, per- perhaps just starting climbing or starting to train harder in climbing, if I can see they've got a training background in pretty much any sport, it gives you an idea that they've, one, committed their ability to put in the work, which mm. is, is quite a, a skill to have in itself. Yeah. Um, but that training volume is transferable between sports, just the ability mm. to do a lot of work, yeah, even definitely. if it's, it's kind of different general movement patterns. Yeah. Um, but the second one I want to unpick a little bit more is, is the forearm conditioning. Mm. Uh, what were you doing in tennis to condition your forearms for, I guess, that repetitive movement of wrist flexion I, and extension? Yeah, I don't feel like we... We definitely did sort of like rolls um, and things, but that wasn't a huge like factor. I think partly because every day, you, were, well, you if you go and play tennis for like, three hours you're hitting the ball like thousands of times in yeah. each and swinging it and your wrist is pretty much always in a like a cocked back L position so you're constantly yeah. working the extensors um I think so the action of itself actually playing I, tennis yeah, is very think, good yeah I so think, what you're saying is we should all <laughs> pick up tennis, tennis yeah. <laughs> and then and that can be that forearm conditioning I, like, yeah. I think I think it's more of just a, a lucky um quince because I basically was playing tennis from like the age of seven until yeah like 18, 19, so I had quite a like large volume of just repeatedly doing that. And I think as I was going through the ages of um, puberty as well, that would have helped with where the muscles would have developed more and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, cool, that's interesting, <laughs> yeah. nice. Okay, um, what would you tell your beginner self knowing what you know now about climbing? So you started oh, yeah. when you are 18, yeah. so we're about 10 years into climbing now and you've obviously You've been to uni, you've learned a lot, and you're also climbing at a very high level now. Yeah. Uh, what one or two lessons would you tell yourself back then when you were 18 and you were starting climbing? Uh, more isn't always more. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's something that often gets missed, um, and I definitely overtrained, um, especially when the lockdowns first hit. I was like, ah, oh, I can't climb outside at all now. I'll just like hammer it, and it was not yeah. the best way to do it. One of the things mm-hmm. for me, um, so this so something that had plagued me through training and perhaps this was doing too much as well the fact mm-hmm. is that you just yeah. said i think we all get really excited about training especially when we find something new or like yeah. this is really cool and we we start doing loads of it but for me i always thought i would go back and tell myself to do more conditioning around my shoulders and probably be more consistent yeah. with fingerboarding because i think what if whoever you ask this question to it usually comes back to their experience over their climbing career and for me, the things that probably held me back most were shoulder niggles and finger niggles. Right. I think yeah. injuries hold you back more than, than just not training enough. It's, it's mm. usually the yeah. other way around, yeah. doing I, too much. Yeah, I always say to people when they ask me, well, in, in the past when they used to ask me about questions about training, it's like, well, what's the best way to get strong? I'm like, the best way to get strong is to not get injured. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> Because you can get in so many more hours of training. That's, like, I think, all time. I would have told myself um, is like, as soon as you felt anything niggly coming on, like, just, yeah, just stop. stop. It's not worth it for that. Through it. Yeah, and spend having... more time doing that prehab style work, like strengthening the shoulders, being a general athlete before you just like hammer the specific stuff over and over again. Because I think yeah. we get really hooked on the specifics, but yeah. I think there's a lot to be said for just actually like being a general athlete. And that's why I think 
coming from a background like tennis or any other sport, I think actually really benefits um, climbers and their progression through the sport because mm. they have that background of, of general conditioning and just learning how to be an athlete. Yeah, I think another thing that helped me um, was when I started route setting because all of a sudden it meant that I had to diversify like the angles of wall that I'd climb on. Mm -hmm. And I think I was often just, like a lot of people, I enjoyed steep physical climbs, so I'd end up just only climbing on the steep physical things. And then it came to setting, it was like, well, you don't have the choice now, you're, you're on a slab, you have to create a problem that's difficult on a slab. Um, how are you gonna know if it's hard if you can't do it kind of thing? Yeah. Um, and I think at, around the time that I started setting, I definitely saw an improvement in my movement and my ability. And I think if I'd, if I'd done that sooner, I think it would have helped a lot more with my climbing and not necessarily setting specifically, but just making sure that I was climbing on the slabs, climbing on the vert, rather than just sticking to like the 45s or the roofs or okay. things like that that I was yeah. enjoying climbing. So diversifying your climbing style so, yeah, and yeah. actually putting learning yeah. more in focus rather than just uh, sticking to what was most fun. Yeah, because yeah, when, when you're new to a sport, it's like it, the, the amount of training that you have to do to get better is minimal because you can just do the activity. And if you enjoy the activity, yeah, that's going to be a way more enjoy, like, enjoyable way of training than going and hanging on a bit of wood or something like to get your fingers like a little bit stronger. So I think I would have gained a lot more by doing a lot more of a well-rounded thing. So, yeah, it's probably about five years or so into my climbing before I started setting. So I basically only climbed on steep stuff until then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely didn't help. Yeah, and then you had to set for a slab and you're like, is that, yeah, yeah, what is like, slab climbing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, oh. And then they'll get told, like, oh, that foothold's too big. And I'm like, I can barely stand on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, so, so this is my last question. Um, and I, I'd say my understanding of your climbing is you're very well accomplished project boulder so you, johnny's mainly a boulder um like very outspoken about hitting sport climbing <laughs> um but you've you've really put in like some impressive like um efforts on some of these harder boulders and you've been working uh this sit start for a while but it's also because of a, a bat ban you have to be very yeah. very committed to actually going back in seasons when it's available um what tips would you give to other boulders when it comes to specifically projecting hard climbs things right at your limit um for me a key thing is always working it like if it's say it's a sustained climb or you've got the more of like a fatiguing element to the climb as well as it just being hard which a lot of the things that i've tended to project have tend to be like slightly on the longer side for boulders so um, how, like how many moves along i think being i mind? think my sweet spot is like eight to twelve moves um okay. but that has then pushed sometimes a bit more closer to like 20 sometimes, but not very often. That's quite a long um, but yeah. That's yeah. like for longer than some of the sport climbing yeah, here in the Peak District. Exactly, yeah. But I think it's mainly because I, I enjoy the, the steeper things. Um, and a lot of the time in the UK, you'll get like a stepped roof where if you're, you're not really climbing on the roof because you keep your feet at the back and then you reach the lip and then you like cut or whatever. So I, because I want to enjoy that whole like being on a, on the roof kind of aspect, it kind of has to be a bit longer. Um, and something that's definitely helped me with that is sort of working a problem like backwards. Okay. So being really dialed on the finish and knowing exactly what you're going to do, because the worst thing that you want to do is be like getting through the crux or whatever, and then still dropping it multiple times because you don't really know the end that well. Yeah. Um, and I feel that's something that's definitely like helped me a lot. Um, yeah. Because I mean, I think that's quite a transferable skill to root climbers. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. yeah, you just get sort of into the autopilot of like, oh yeah, I know what I'm doing. Don't really have to think about it. And also, that's when you're likely to be sort of, if you if you've hit the sort of flow state and mm -hmm. you're climbing like mindlessly, that'll be when you loot can be like losing and think, oh my god, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. And then you, you like, yeah, and then you make mistakes. Whereas if you just know that like the back of your hand, I think that's probably one of the most useful bits for me that okay. I've done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really dialing in the finish. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Making yeah. sure it's kind of like just on autopilot mode when you exactly get exactly yeah cool. yeah nice one so we'll finish it there but that was cool. really interesting thank you johnny you're welcome um uh so we've also got ros uh coming in which is another yeah. coach so stick around for that video um if you enjoyed this video and the tips that johnny gave you just then don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time